some uh, introductions as well as um, kind of housekeeping items for today. Uh, thanks everyone and thank you professor for taking the time today to join us for our fireside discussion on intergovernmental organizations and career paths and certainly uh, Dr. Dimitrov's stories and, and professional journey through it. Uh, today's session will begin with a, a, a prepared Q&A session um, and uh, professor will have a series of uh, insights as well as slides to share with us. Um, and we'll, we'll follow this up with a Q&A session where you can really get into nitty gritty and submit your questions and what you're curious about um, uh, within after about 20 minutes to half an hour. Uh, feel free to submit your question in the chat box directly and we'll, we'll be sure to take it up afterwards or you can raise your hand and we'll be sure to ask Professor uh, after the session as well. Um, I know that I, most of us already uh, know Professor and his work, but for the extremely slim majority of uh, those of us here today, I would love to give a very brief introduction on Professor Dimitrov um, and his uh, scholarly leadership as well as contributions. Um, Professor Dimitrov's academic expertise is on climate change negotiations, UN diplomacy, and international institutions and global environmental politics. Professor has participated in UN conferences for more than 20 years, <clears throat> representing the EU in international climate change negotiations, and helped negotiate the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, the body of Professor's work covers the history of climate negotiations from behind closed doors and explores the politics of policy making. Based on firsthand participatory observations of international diplomacy, Professor introduces two key concepts to global governance scholarship, empty institutions, and non-regimes. Looking at this, the theoretical aspects of Professor's research pertain to the role of institutions, effective negotiating strategies, argumentation, persuasion, and the role of climate and environmental policy. Professor, really appreciate your time today. Thanks for what you're joining us. Thank you, Leo. Uh, I really want to extend publicly um, my appreciation and gratitude to Leo for once again organizing an event that is essentially a service to the students. Um, and I, and I, as every, everyone who has known Leo will know that he's been absolutely exemplary in taking the initiative, you know, to do things that are really useful and helpful to others. Um, and I do think that today's session is going to really uh, bring some value to your planning for the future. Um, and I want to encourage you to really use this opportunity and raise any questions that you have before we finish today. Uh, it is also great to see some of you. Um, I, I recognize a number of faces um, and I hope to see more faces, like I know Mia is hiding there somewhere. Um, but uh, it is I'm very nice to be- pajamas. I have to quickly change, I'm sorry. Hi, Mia. Um, it is very nice to be back with you guys, uh, even virtually. Um, so today, uh, what I'd like to do is sort of give people a sense of what are the different options of getting into the world of international organizations in particular, but also more broadly in international careers related to political science and international relations. Um, and we are going to um, also look at a couple of very specific stories of people, how they got there. Um, and first I want to start <clears throat> a presentation. Um, I hope everyone is able to see the screen. Yes, that's great. So um, just as a general introduction, if you are in IR, the principal careers that can be related to your studies and your degree are the following. First, you can work for a government. Uh, you can work in diplomacy for the foreign ministry uh, or for any other department of the government that has op international operations. You can also work for an international organization, which will make you an international civil servant. Uh, the word diplomat is uh, quite ambiguous. You can be a diplomat within international organizations. You can be a diplomat within a government representing strictly your own country. <clears throat> then, you can, then you have civil society. You can join an NGO and essentially become a lobbyist or an activist in the non-governmental sector. Or you can go into the academia by pursuing a graduate degree. And uh, if you go into a master's degree, that is typically for 
um, jobs in the policy world. If you want to continue for, towards the PhD, uh, then that will take you to, towards a university career. And uh, one um, note is that if you want to teach at the university, that is when you need a PhD. But if you don't want to do that, then there is no other reason to pursue a PhD. Um, also, you can uh, choose to work for some think tank or some other research unit outside of a university as a po po political analyst. So this is the general terrain of, po of uh, career options. Now, let me introduce you to Jen McAlpine, somebody um, I have known for quite a few years. This is the lady on the left. This photograph looks old because it is old. It was taken in 1999 when I started going uh, to work uh, at the UN. Jen McAlpine at that time was the, essentially the head of the American delegation to all international negotiations related to forest management and deforestation. She is articulate, she was highly skilled, uh, not always likable, but certainly a very dynamic individual. Here she is uh, together with the head of the Brazilian delegation because Brazil and the United States worked very, very closely to make sure that they kill any prospect for an international treaty to combat deforestation. And after she personally paid a lot of efforts to, to kill that prospect of meaningful international cooperation on forests, lo and behold, she became, became the director or the, rather the executive director in a way of the United Nations Forum on Forests, which is an international organization that was established following a proposal that she made on behalf of the United States and that still remains the main international uh, body related to forests. Um, after a few years, she moved on and she um, went to work for civil society. Uh, she got an offer first to work in Geneva for IUCN, which is the International Union for Concerned um, Scientists, um, or the, oh no, for the conservation of nature. Um, I don't think that she took the offer. Instead, uh, she went to work for some other body in a, within the non-state sector. And so what this really serves to emphasize is that very often uh, people will switch roles within world politics. And once you enter that world, you may change jobs you know, from government to organizations to civil society. And that is a fairly frequent phenomena um, and we can call it the revolving door phenomena. Um, I went through the revolving door myself. Um, this is a photograph from 2003 in Geneva um, during a meeting of the before mentioned UNFF, United Nations Forum on Forests. And at the time, um, I was uh, working for an organization called the Earth Negotiations Bulletin. Um, I joined the Earth Negotiations Bulletin when I was in graduate school. I was working on my PhD and I had selected to write a dissertation on the negotiations of environmental treaties and particularly the role of science, the scientific information. Um, I wanted to go and attend meetings and for a while um, I was not able to get access. I tried to get a job with the Earth Negotiations Bulletin, uh, which is an organization hired by the UN to send teams of people to all of the negotiations and write extensive and detailed summaries of who said what during every day of, of negotiations. And it sounded like a dream job. So um, it sounded like a dream job and I really wanted it and I, sent a CV to the boss um, and I didn't uh, hear from the person for a while. Uh, it didn't seem to be going anywhere. Uh, then he said, well, just if you come to New York, just give me a call. 
Um, and eventually it was a sort of fairly disappointing experience, but there was an international meeting uh, on forests organized by Canada. And I simply found the contact information, the phone number of the organizers. And I called them and I said, uh, will I be able to access, to gain access to the meeting uh, for research purposes? And the person said, well, he was a French speaker. So he said, uh, can you tell me a little bit more about your research? Uh, and I described the dissertation and then I hear in the on the phone, would you like to work for us? And I'm like, who is this? <laughs> um, this took me to the first meeting uh, where I was hired as a facilitator of the negotiations actually. And on venue, I met members of that organization, the Earth Negotiations Bulletin, who encouraged me to contact again uh, the director. And a year later, I was in New York um, for an internship. I contacted them and I started working for them. Um, so far, one moral of the story is that sometimes it takes a long time to really start your first job within international relations. It can be a very disappointing, uh, frustrating experience that requires a lot of patience, perseverance, um, but usually it is a matter of time. Um, I worked for the ENB for about eight years in parallel to my academic work. In the meantime, I finished the PhD, I got a job at a university in the United States, but I continued to work for the ENB at UN conferences several times a year. Um, that work puts you in very, very close communication with a number of diplomats and policymakers from around the world uh, at various meetings. And that is a key factor because contacts really become opportunities. And uh, eventually um, I started working for a government representing the government of Bulgaria, um, but also the European Union at UN climate negotiations, uh, which started in 2009. Um, the photograph on the right here is from uh, a conference in 2009 in December in Copenhagen. Um, and uh, later on, I, I became more and more involved, having more and more of an active role in the climate talks until the Paris negotiations uh, that led to the Paris Agreement in 2015, uh, where I, <clears throat> I was quite deeply involved in the, in the negotiations. And I made a statement there during uh, a very important meeting of the European Union uh, that made an impact and eventually uh, the European Commission uh, sort of solicited my help in revising the strategy of the European Union um, in not only negotiating with other countries on climate, but also in how they communicate politically to civil society and NGOs. So just like the story of Jan McAlpine, who switched from government to international organizations to civil society, you can see that in the second story, we have a similar trajectory of somebody who starts from the academia, uh, moves on to, well, let's say it's a civil society job, and then goes on to a government delegation and eventually gets into to work for an international organization, which is the European Union, uh, where I was um, co-chairing the task force that was established to implement my new negotiating strategy for the EU. Um, and so I think that these two stories uh, demonstrate, illustrate quite uh, usefully uh, the fact that usually it's a matter of just starting somewhere within the system. Uh, and almost invariably, one opportunity leads to another. Um, but I would suggest that for anybody who is finishing a bachelor's degree, like yourselves, um, graduate school is one, certainly one option. Um, if you go into graduate school and you specialize in something in particular and develop an expertise, then you will have a, a higher chance of uh, getting into the system. Now, let's switch, um, switch 
wavelengths and take a look at uh, some pathways uh, that can take you to a career within intergovernmental organizations in particular. So for the rest of the uh, our time, we're not going to discuss getting into either government or civil society, but we'll focus on international organizations. Uh, first of all, uh, a person is capable of directly applying to work for, uh, um, for the UN system, for instance. Um, then, the, uh, and I will discuss this uh, in the next slides. A second path that you could take is to enter the government realm of presumably Canada, but um, uh, China, if you're a citizen of China or, or another country. Um, if you start working for a branch of government that has any type of international operations, it doesn't have to be the foreign ministry, eventually you can work your way up through a career where you are assigned to be a member of a delegation and go and attend international negotiations on a particular issue. Um, and that essentially takes you into, the, into diplomacy. Um, then the third way would be to start working for an NGO and NGOs also, uh, the large NGOs send delegations to all kinds of international meetings. So that's another pathway. Um, in between, you can also think about internships. Internships are actually one particularly, um, I think, easy way. Um, I had a I was telling someone recently a story of having a student who was um, considering how to get into that world. And I said, go get an internship. She got an internship in Jordan uh, with the United Nations Development Program. She spent the summer there. Uh, they they really liked, liked her a lot. And they went to the extent of creating a job so that she can apply so that they can keep her on a permanent basis. And that led indeed to a job. And um, she just uh, recently, a couple of weeks ago, um, wrote to me back. Um, and I think that she's having a very successful career. Um, and then finally, you can go to gra through graduate school. Um, and um, I'm going to put this in brackets. I don't want to spend a lot of time right now, but I encourage you to. Um, ask questions later on about this. Um, okay, so if you're working um, in the UN system, uh, there are various categories of jobs um, and you have to be aware that most of them, the advanced ones are not accessible to you at this point of your professional development. Um, they are accessible only for people who are already within the system. The language requirements are not particularly uh, difficult these days because virtually all business is conducted in English. And if you are a fluent speaker of English, you do not absolutely have to have other languages. Although I would say Mandarin would be the first one that will give you an advantage. Um, you could apply only with a bachelor's degree. You don't have to have an advanced degree. And um, later on, let's talk about some of the key skills. Um, I, know, I know Leo has a number of questions for me, so we can skip this. Now, um, let's discuss the option of directly applying for the system. Um, there is something called the Young Professionals Program. And if you... Um, Follow the link, pay attention to the website. Uh, it will give you information about a, an exam, examination system. Uh, you could register essentially and take a written exam. And if you succeed, take a verbal exam that can put you into the system. Um, and I would like to tell you just a very specific story once again that, um, that illustrates this. Um, one of my classmates in the master's program uh, of international peace studies that I completed, uh, she was from Belgium, uh, Beatrice, and she applied uh, for those examinations at the UN while she was in the program. 
Uh, she said it was very difficult. She prepared for several months in order to, to be well prepared and then succeeded. She passed, they put her on a waiting list and they said, you know, if something opens up, we'll let you know. Uh, and then when, within a couple of months, uh, they contacted her and they said, well, we have a position for one year in Suriname. Um, and people who, who like geography games uh, know that Suriname is a country in the northern part of South Africa, sorry, <laughs> South America. Um, it wasn't a particularly attractive one. It was actually had to do with computer management. Somebody, they, they, the government needed somebody to go and help them set up a computer system, a database. And she was wondering whether she should go. She decided to go. And then um, she was very dissatisfied. She really didn't like it at all. But it led to other opportunities within the UN system. And today, she, as far as I know, well, the last time I heard from her, uh, she works in Geneva uh, in a very, very comfortable position. Um, I, th I can't remember which branch of the UN system it was, um, but um, it, it really led to a very stable career in, in the UN. Okay. So I encourage you to look at the website, uh, the Young Professionals Program. Internships um, are widely available in the UN system in particular. There is a special website that you should check out that lists everything. Um, they have a search engine. Uh, you can select by location. You can select by the part of the UN system. The bad news is that they're typically not well paid or not paid at all. So you can assume that you'll have to finance an internship yourself. Uh, but if you go to, you know, if you go for a month, it might be good to, as an investment that you will keep on your resume uh, and can lead somewhere. And then finally, uh, there's a website that uh, actually lists, not, right now it's not available, but the, they actually list the jobs available within the UN system. And curiously, some of those jobs are for people with bachelor's degrees, including uh, political science and international relations. However, typically, um, an absolute requirement is that that person has an actual work experience in the field. <clears throat> um, I was looking, uh, I was checking this website recently. For example, the World Health Organization right now is hiring like crazy, uh, and they typically want a, a, a BA, um, but they do want you to have work experience. Uh, you can be, for example, a communication specialist. Um, there was a project, I, I forget the titles, um, hijack. Okay. Are you professor? Uh, Hi. So just so that um, this is, I think, a, a very sensible time to take a break uh, and basically switch gears. So I'd like to actually um, pause here and ask whether there are any questions uh, by anyone, Leo or someone else. Yeah, I'll hold my questions if anyone has any else. Feel free to message or come directly off mute. Uh, Professor, oh, oh, yeah, Katrina, go ahead. Um, this might be a little too specific, but um, and I don't know, it's just like wondering if you may or may not know the answer, but do you know, like, obviously, over the past 20 years, things have changed a lot, but do you see a lot of or uh, any representation of people with disabilities in the UN system or like in any work you did? <laughs> Uh, Katrina, uh, I'm sorry, uh, but I can't hear you very well. The the voice doesn't. Can you hear me now? I think that's a bit better. Yeah. 
Yeah, sure. Um, I was wondering if in your time of working in the UN or like during your career, were there any like representation of people with disabilities in your field? Still didn't hear it. Is it possible? For, can you uh, please professor? just uh, write it in the in the chat? Professor, because I think I believe Katrina asked if uh, in the last twenty years of you working with the UN, have you seen representations of those living with disabilities in the system? Yes, um, I have. Yes, I have, and I think that the political climate now is uh, much more conducive to people with disabilities. Um, and I think that um, based on my impressions, uh, there is no one with disabilities should have any hesitation in applying for any of the things that I have listed um, because there really um, are not any serious obstacles for people who want a career in, in IGOs. Yeah. Thanks, Professor. And Cecilia? Excuse me for a sec. I'll just grab some water. I'll oh, no right problem. Yeah. I might get to go now. Okay, great. Um, so hi, Professor. My question is about um, when applying to these jobs that you have listed above, do you have any tips and advice for us to, in terms of the application process or the interview process? And what are the odds of them actually like offering you this kind of opportunity? Mm. Um, I think that's... Um... It's not really about the application, but what the application reflects. Uh, essentially, it is about bringing substance to the table that is credible. And there are very real limits to what an application can do in order to decorate your expertise or experience. Um, essentially, um, I think that Anybody who wants a career within the UN system needs to think about the specific expertise that they can bring. You know, what is the real value there? Um, because without such expertise, no amount of charm, charisma, or persuasion is going to really uh, get you in there. Sometimes, um, just to... to emphasize to illustrate this, sometimes you don't even need um, an education in international relations. Um, I have met people on, let's say, the Canadian delegation to forest meetings uh, who got, you know, their degrees in forest management. And they don't actually know much about international relations or world politics, uh, but they know the substance of the policy that is being discussed, right? They know what forest management is. Um, and similarly, if you are in political science, so if you go into a master's degree, which I do recommend, um, you need to think about specializing into one specific topic and then spending the entire program, whether it is one or two years, folding as many research papers and projects into that particular area so that you can build an expertise and so that by the end of the master's program, you can come and credibly say, I have an expertise on this topic. Uh, generalization is absolutely the worst thing that you can do in an MA program. The key word is specialization because that is what will develop that substance that you can bring, that, that you can reflect in an application. Uh, the application itself, um, the only thing that I would recommend is just uh, fairly boring. Uh, just follow the, the instructions verbatim. 
uh, do not be creative, um, provide exactly what they're asking for, do not provide anything else, but make sure that you give them everything they want. Right? Anyone else? I have to admit, I have to admit that uh, I feel a little bit pressed for time right now because I'm aware that we have one hour. Uh, but if you uh, are free longer, then we can sort of relax and take it easy and then cover everything. Pastor, this meeting room is open until to 12, 12.30. So as long as people have time. Okay. Oh, and Jack. Hi, Professor. So um, to, co to continue on that conversation there, that, uh, that point actually stuck with me. Um, specialization is much more important than generalization. Uh, to that point, um, given the current like political climate and the way that the world is changing, what do you recommend uh, um, that uh, students in our, uh, in our shoes should specialize in? You mentioned that um, the World Health Organization, that's something that's uh, very important in hiring a lot right now. What other fields do you think may be of um, uh, importance over the next uh, few decades? Mm. Well, first of all, it has to be a specific area of public policy, whether it is, um, you know, health policy or environmental policy, arms control. Those are examples. And then it, if you, let's say, are in a master's program in political science or um, international relations of some kind, then I would suggest that you choose your favorite topic. And then again, you take as many relevant courses as possible. Um, and then within every course, write a research paper that addresses one aspect of this right so that you can essentially build a multifaceted perspective on the one single topic so specifically what would be popular what would be strategically good to invest in for the next years um Don't take Ukraine, it's too cheap. <laughs> it's too obvious. Um, and um, I uh, think that you could, well, I'm biased, but I do think that environmental policy uh, is an area that is you know, expanding everywhere. In, in every country, they're building capacity for environmental policy. Um, I do think that this is something that is here to stay with us uh, and that will be and that the job market for relevant professions will be increasing at least for the next 10 years, e expanding. So that's something to consider. Um, I do not. I think that um, anything that has to do with development would be good. Um, anything that has to do with health policy, maybe for the next five years or so. Uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Uh, Yash? Hi. Uh, so I missed the meeting. This my laptop wouldn't turn on. It might be broken. But uh, so on the topic of specialization, I know for me right now, there's two very different things that I'm specializing in. I'm writing in a lot. And I know you said you're you're biased for my, my environmental policy. For example, one of mine's nuclear uh, policy, and the other one is cyber policy. So I'm writing extensively on both of them. Did you see yourself really going into environmental policy from the get-go? Just because my big concern is if if I choose between one and the two, if I realize that that really wasn't the one that I would have preferred. Yeah. So I'm like in the point in the position where I feel like I'm afraid of pigeonholing myself. If that makes sense. Um. I remember in when I was in my master's program, um, I read the New York Times uh, the, and I saw something on the first page that had to do with climate impacts. And I read it and I had this moment of saying, you know, this is going to change the world. Um, so yeah, in a certain sense, I was pretty 
you know, I, I decided very early that I want to focus on this. Um, eventually, mind you, that I'm, I'm, I don't consider myself an expert in the environment. I consider myself still uh, working on diplomacy and negotiations. It just happens to be within envir environmental politics. Um, but I also would suggest, you know, step back from all these topics, specific topics. Um, I think that you need to find a way to become relevant to the world. Relevant to what is happening and being capable of bringing something, contributing something of value. Uh, because we live in a world where everybody's trying to impress everybody, but the, the truth is that nobody really gives a damn about anybody. I mean, nobody's going to be very impressed with you unless likely you are actually are able to contribute to their work in some meaningful way. You know, people are not impressed otherwise. Um, there are a lot of people who are achievers, overachievers, et cetera, et cetera. But it's really about whether you're able to help some cause and, and contribute to, uh, to work that is important. So you need to find something that you care enough about, sorry, care about enough, but something that also uh, matters to a, a lot of other people and is, is prominent enough. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Oh, Professor, I got a question. Uh, I got a question in the chat that I can read aloud for Kieran. Uh, do you have any advice for students early in their undergraduate studies? As in first or second year? Uh, yes. Um, generalization. Generalizing. This is the time to actually not specialize in something, but to learn about various topics. So take a, a, my advice would be take a variety of classes if that's with, within what's possible, and then learn about various issues in world politics and political science, because that will help you figure out what you are truly interested in. Yeah. Yes, actually, um, Sooner or later, whatever you're applying for, you will need letters of recommendation. Um, and I think that this is a good time to think strategically um, because when the time comes, you need letters from people who know you very well. And that typically means somebody you've taken a at least two courses with. Um, and so, think about maybe three professors whom you would like to get to know uh, professionally and you know take a couple of courses with each so that you have somebody to go to um, in the fourth year. Thank you, Professor. Anyone else? Oh, sorry. Professor, it looks like we're in the clear for now. Okay. Um, so here I put together um, some useful links um, and we can just take a look at what they mean. Uh, So pay attention, please, to the websites. Um, this one lists all kinds of jobs within not only the UN system, but other organizations as well. Hey, Professor? Yep. Sorry to interrupt. Um, we, we can't see the website screen. Ah, OK. That's interesting. Let me, let me start again. OK, okay. About we're good now, yeah. Okay, good. So this is an extensive database that you can um, use for all kinds of organizations. Uh, 
Um, if you're specifically interested in UN jobs, um, this is a website that can be used instead of the one that is under maintenance now. Uh, when you follow the link, uh, it will basically list all the requirements, um, deadlines, elements of the application. It will basically guide you. Guide you. I'll skip this. Uh, and there are other job search engines. Um, one of them I like is the so-called um, impact pool. And as you can see, you know, World Health Organization, World Health Organization. So let's take a look at one specific one. It describes what they will want the person to do. And here are the required qualifications. <clears throat> they don't even require a university degree but they want somebody to actually have experience in accounting and or administrative work. And if that experience is within the UN system or other organization, then they have an advantage. Um, Yeah, it's really astonishing, like the WHO is just hiring left and right. Now, if you do want to go to Rome, where is the headquarters of the Food and Agriculture Organization is, it's a, it's a fairly nice, well, it's a very old building, but it's in a very central place. Uh, they're also hiring, and here, Again, let's see, minimum requirements. Advanced university degree, which means probably a master's degree in various uh, fields, including um, by implication, including political science. And um, I found the list of competencies to be um, quite instructive because indeed, if you have to identify what are the key skills, uh, it's always teamwork because you will work as a member of a team. Um, and so people with good social skills who can navigate conflict and avoid it are always going to be more successful. In fact, I would say if you have um, People who without such skills um, are not going to last very long uh, because this is a, the international organizations are pretty much the most politically correct workplace that I have ever seen. Uh, everybody is like super, super careful not to, you know, step on anybody's toes and to be very pleasant and very agreeable and very likable. Uh, it, and it's really just like a distinct tribe, like anybody who works for the UN for more than two years, you will get that kind of um, vibe from them. Communication skills are also very, very important, uh, both written and verbal. Uh, yeah, so these two I would identify as the absolutely crucial ones. Okay. Um, Then there's something called Indeed, and this focuses actually um, on government jobs in Canada. Um, again, you can search, you can um, basically put in international relations or some other field. Uh, you can specify where exactly you want to work, uh, which province, which city. Um, and I think that is... Um, That's very useful to look at.
And then finally, with civil society, um, I found this website. I'm, I'm sure there are other ones, perhaps even better ones. Uh, but <clears throat> here are some sites where you can start. DVEX, for example. Relief web that focuses on humanitarian jobs. DevNet jobs. So that's uh, a bit one too much. So, um, Let's talk more. Any any questions you have? Well, I have to admit, for me, it's been a very long day. I've been at work all day, so I'm running a little bit on vapors. But do you have any questions, Professor? I'll pick from the questions that we plan ahead of time to add one in here. Uh, as people are thinking of questions, I think I think a lot of us are here because we see the merits and, and we see the value in a lot of a lot of this work, um, and and feel compelled to to learn more. Uh, in your experience in, in these kinds of institutions, where as you mentioned, there's a lot of sacrifice, there's a lot of like ambiguity, uncertainty as to when you're going to get another contract job, um, concessions you have to make on what role you have to take. Um, what what in your opinion are some uh, characteristics or trade-offs of the job that people should be mindful of before they enter. And this could, whether uh, work-life balance or, or incomes or, or family and stuff like that, having, being compelled to travel abroad all the time um, in your experience, what are some of, the, some of these things that you think people should be aware of before going in? Yeah, well, specifically if it's about international organizations, um, Salaries are quite decent, you know, they're quite adequate. Uh, they also, uh, the, the, the packages include benefits that are quite good, including uh, travel. Um, I don't know very much about the pensions benefits, uh, but my sense is that any lasting career as an international civil ser servant, you know, is fairly comfortable from this point of view. Um, what people have to be prepared is that there will be a lot of travel. Um, and that means away, time away from home and family. Um, I know people who are traveling like more than half of the time of the year, they're, they're gone, right? Um, another factor is that if you're within the UN system, uh, you could expect every several years to be either reallocated re or you see new opportunities and then you move somewhere else. So in general, just like the life of a diplomat, um, you know, you have to be prepared that you'll be moving every several years to another country, right? And if it fits your style, great. Uh, if it doesn't, um, People with strong opinions are not going to do very well in that world. When you have strong views on something, uh, you are going to share them. And again, it seems that that world is full of people who are kind of waltzing around issues and you know they speak sweetly without really offending anyone. Um, So that's something to consider. Um, yeah, but travel, travel is probably the main, the main factor. Um, you either get used to jet lag or you very soon get really tired of it and you just say the hell with it. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. Does anyone else have any questions? 
If not, if not, I'll ask another one from our pre-plan list. Um, Professor, in, in your time uh, with, with, with these um, international organizations, how have you seen people or jobs and, and kind of uh, the labor force demands change um, in, in, in these years? Of, in terms of what kinds of candidates they look for geographically. I know there's sometimes there's preferential programs for countries in the global south. Um, mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's demand for you know, new technologies, for example, and how can this inform new undergrads or master students interested in, in joining the system? Hmm. I don't think I, I can say anything useful. Uh, only because I don't have any experience with the with the application process in any of those organizations. I never actually had to apply uh, to work um, within organizations. Um, everything was, you know, through personal contacts. And so, yeah, I'm not I'm not going to pretend that I know anything about this. So, if you could tell, if you could help yourself. Um something when when you're at the age of 18 to 22 about the the career that you're about to embark on what would some keynotes would be hmm. okay mm. i think that it is what i said earlier that you need to think about um, committing to a particular topic in which you specialize that is both interesting so that you can you know, keep doing it as well as important in the world. Um, and essentially commit to that path and follow it knowing that there will be elements of boredom it's not going to be always interesting there will be difficulties there will be disappointments um and just persevering yeah 